Hello everyone, welcome to today's Spania chat. So today I'm here with Heavens and Tom and we're talking about the first inquiry. So today we're going to be talking about everything that you need to know about um, what is the first step when you want to make a career change to foster care, who you talk to, what they ask you, and what you might be interested in knowing about it as well. So, okay, so my, my first question is, what is the initial inquiry? I think that's the most important thing to start with. Yes, thanks, thanks, Marta. Um, well, the first inquiry uh, is just uh, an initial assessment that we give to anyone who wants to, uh, who makes an inquiry on fostering, or maybe they want to understand a little bit more about fostering. Uh, we take them through that questionnaire um most in most cases we do it over the phone or we can also do it in person sometimes when we do it live events you know people come to our stand we can actually take them through that questionnaire uh but for the majority of our inquiries they actually come over the over the phone or even via email yeah so uh, we take them through this questionnaire we don't send you any questionnaire we actually just you know, ask you questions in a very casual way, but, you know, we're actually taking you through the, the initial inquiry itself. Yeah, so it's basically for those people who really want to get into fostering or who just want to understand uh, what it's all about. Okay, thank you. Um, so would you like to take us through the uh, initial uh, for the questionnaires and such, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the, the first layer of, uh, well, the first part of the of our, of our questions, we want to understand about your household composition. Uh, so this part deals with, you know, your personal details like your name, you know, uh, your date of birth, your address. Uh, this is just key information that we, co that we collect so that we can uh, uh, find out, you know, your age, you know, whether you're married or you're single, all those things, they don't stop you from fostering, it's just for us to understand uh, where you are coming from in terms of your background, uh, where you live is also very important because we you know, want to make sure that we can actually provide a service in the area that you live. So Banya is a nationwide uh, agency, but obviously it's good practice to just make sure that we can actually provide you the excellent service that everybody else uh, in, in, in Banya gets based on where you're living. Yeah, so uh, we also want to, you know, just get information like your, you know, the number of people that are actually living in the house, you know, how many children you've got, you know, whether you've got you know, five, two, one, you know, uh, are you married, are you single? All those things are, are critical for us to, to help you as well. Um, which local authority uh, are you, do you belong to? Uh, it helps us to know, uh, for example, if we wanted to do a local authority check to know exactly which local authority that you belong to. You'd be surprised that sometimes, especially people who live, uh, uh, if you live in, in Hereford, for example, you know, you may assume that the local authority goes to Hereford Share Council, but, you know, it may, it may be going through to a more specific council where you, where you, where you pay your council tax. So, so that's very critical information. You know, does anybody in the house smoke, for example? Uh, that's also important because it changes the age groups of children that you can look after. So, you know, in normal circumstances, you can look after children from zero to 18. Uh, but if there's a smoker in the house, that, very, that age uh, guidance changes to five to 18. So if you smoke, it doesn't stop you from fostering. Uh, it just changes, you know, the minimum age of children that you can actually look after. Um, and we ask questions about your nationality. Um, it's not, it's nothing to do with discrimination. It's all about actually understanding your your background because as Banya, we value diversity. We value where you come from, and we know that um, it's actually who you are, and you bring that into fostering. And, you know, actually local authorities around the country, they also like to counter match. So, for example, if, you, um, if you're a Brazilian, for example, and we do happen to have a child who actually comes from the same background, you know, guess what? The local authority would actually opt to place that child with you because you can meet the child's needs in terms of language, 
diet, you know, and just understanding where they're coming from in terms of background. So, um, so those are, but, you know, it's not to say that we place kids only based on, you know, uh, your background, but, you know, foster carers can look after children from any kind of background. So that's, that, that is what we, we do. Um, do you have any restrictions to live uh, and work in the UK? Certainly a very important question. We want to make sure that everybody who uh, comes on board our team is actually uh, legally allowed to live in, and work in the UK. So we ask that question, uh, though for some people they find it a little bit uncomfortable. But, you know, you are sure that when you're talking to us, you know, nobody else is going to know about your business. It's all confidential, you know, and, and it's not shared with any anybody else yeah so it's just an inquiry that's what it is we're just finding out you know where you are um and obviously we asked a very interesting question like you know why do you want to foster so that question is very critical because it allows me as as the assessor to understand where you're coming from what your motivations are it, it also helps me to um to manage your expectations, you know, because some people may have very uh, un unrealistic expectations uh, when, when it comes to fostering. So it helps us to talk about it and to see how we can really, you know, manage, you know, what the role entails um, again as to what you're expecting. So that's a very, that's really the, the main frame of the household accommodation questions that we ask. We have a question in the chat from someone who just joined. Shipa, hello. Thank you for joining us. Shipa is asking, do people get support to fill in the forms? Actually, uh, the good part about it is that you don't actually get to fill in this form. Uh, we, 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 we do it for you. Um, all you do is just uh, answer questions. So uh, we, don't get, we don't email you the form. We don't you know, ask you to fill it in. We actually just, you know, Take you through the form in terms of you know over the phone ask you questions like i'm doing now and uh you know give you an opportunity to answer you know and ask questions you know during that also conversation as well it's, it's a good place the, the, the purpose for this is not to interrogate you you know or to try and you to reveal or you know the secrets of your life is just for us to help you to understand where you are and how we can actually help you with uh with your inquiry on, on fostering Okay, and also if I understood correctly, you can have your own biological children while you foster. There is no issue between the two. Absolutely. I mean, uh, most people who get into fostering, they actually live with their own kids. Um, so, so we encourage, you know, uh, parents who are actually looking after their own children to actually get into fostering and look after, uh, look after children as well because... Uh, they, you're already looking after kids, so you've got experience, you've got, you know, it's, it's just the same kind of thing, just in a slightly different way. Uh, but the reason why we ask about, you know, how many children you have is so we can figure out, you know, how, you know, we can figure out whether you've thought about, you know, how fostering will fit into your family dynamic, you know, especially if you've got very young children or if you've got all boys or girls. We want to see, you know, have you thought about, you know, and you know what types of children you want to look after and how they would fit into your family dynamic so for example you may have children who are grown up who are now adults in the house um, so this is a good place for us to figure out whether you've actually had a conversation with your children talk about your plan to foster if you haven't then we'll encourage you to do that because you will need their support uh, or at least you would need them to be aware that mommy and daddy are you know mom or dad is planning uh, on bringing in another child in the house so it's, it's it's a good place to to find out about you know your family dynamic there as well and um just wondering with regards to older children would that have a different dynamic as to uh, regards to someone who has children under 18 Absolutely. I mean, uh, when you've got older children, you actually have a bit a bigger advantage because your older children can actually become your uh, greatest support in terms of uh, backup carers. Um, they become your first line of defense, right? <laughs> if I may state like that. Um, so when you become a foster carer, you find that you know. Uh, those people who have got kids in the house who are older, you know, they will be the ones who will really be 
very supportive and who help you along in the times when you need help, uh, when you need backup support, maybe you need to attend to something, you know, they are there in the house. So, you know, they're the best um, kind of people to also look after the kids. But also, again, uh, when you, we don't assume that, you know, they're all going to be available to help you. It may be that they uh, may also be busy, you know, running their lives. So it, yes, it, it changes the dynamic. And the critical thing when you've got all the children in the house is to make sure that, you know, they are supportive uh, and they are available. If they're not available to, to support you, uh, at least they need to be in agreement with your plan to foster. And they also need to agree to have uh, their DPS checks done. This is the police check as well, because they are adults, and which means they are now accountable when it comes to the law in terms of how they live their lives. So we want to make sure that the kids that are coming into your house, they also are coming in a safe space. Uh, so they also need to agree to having their police check done as well. Okay. Um, so should, so basically, in other words, so older children were expect are they uh, expected to help out with um, the fostering? and um, the care of the foster children? Yeah, well, the expectation, uh, every parent obviously would expect their kids to help out, but we understand that, you know, they're out of there for their own lives. If they don't want to, if they, if they don't have the time or the capacity to, to help you, um, but the important thing is that, you know, they are supportive. Uh, you wouldn't want to have a uh, looked after child in the same space with your son or your daughter who's actually not in agreement you know, with it. So it creates a very tense atmosphere, both for you and for the child. So it's important that if they don't, if, they, if they're not available to help as backup support, uh, but they are in agreement and they are willing to create that homely, safe environment uh, whenever a child is placed in with you. Okay. So speaking of what placement, um, the next part of the uh, query is the accommodation itself. So the household, the physical yes. house. Yeah, so um, on, on the accommodation aspect, what we're really trying to ascertain is, you know, do you have enough space? Uh, this is the key uh, question that we're trying to ascertain here. So we'll ask you questions like, what kind of accommodation do you live in? Uh, is it a house? Is it a flat? Is it, uh, is it a mansion? <laughs> you know, is it, uh, what kind of a place it is? You know, so, so we can understand. So it's, it's about, you know, creating a mental picture because you know, I'm not there, uh, but you were there. So you're able to explain to me, hey, I live in a big mansion. You know, I've got, you know, in a gated community somewhere. You know, or I live in a flat, a nice flat, two bedroom house, two bedroom flat, you know, on the third floor. That information is critical because it helps us to explore certain things that we may need to talk about in terms of your accommodation. The critical thing being space. Uh, so we want to understand, okay, if you have got a three bedroom house, uh, how many people live in the property? You know, so uh, the, the general principle is that we need to make sure that everybody has got access to a bedroom. So if it's a couple, you've got access to your bedroom. And if you've got two children, your two children have got access to their own bedroom. So, and then whatever then is uh, surplus in terms of a space, a spare rooms, that that is the room that we can then say, hey, this is what is available to, for fostering. So if you have four children, for example, and you live in a four bedroom house, uh, we'll be able to say, hey, you know, uh, I don't think we've, you've got enough space. Um, so, and this is maybe where a lot of people are found, you know, in a, find themselves in a very hard place because they really want to foster and then they don't have, they, we realize when we're talking about space that there isn't really enough space. So the foster child must have access to their own room and uh, your own children, including you as, as the applicant or applicants, you also need to have access to your own rooms as well. So okay. space is a very important uh, aspect of uh, to fostering. So we talk about that in terms of, you know, do you live in a rented accommodation, for example, or is it your own house? Um, and, you know, there, there's aspects to that that we want to make sure that you've got the landlord's consent to actually foster, uh, look after children in, in that house. Uh, we've had situations where in the past where some uh, well-meaning people 
get in on uh, kickstart their application, and then months down the road, uh, they discover that the landlord is not in agreement. So it's it's heartbreaking and it sets them back a little bit. So we want to we try and avoid that by getting the consent from the landlord quite early on. Um, and what about like uh, sibling? You said about uh, siblings and stuff. So I know some people grow up um, sharing a bedroom with their brother and sister, and also that might be the same for uh, foster children as well. Does is there any um, explain that for me? Please? Yeah. So for example, uh, you can have a call from somebody saying, "Hey, I want to foster. I've got room. I've got two children. One is the first one is the, the youngest is one." the second child is three and and they share a room with me for example and i've got two rooms free <laughs> you know so when we have that situation i'll be able to explain to them like look you know your kids may be sharing them your room with you now but you know they actually need access to their own bedroom and they will need it in the future and so if we if we if we approve you to be a foster carer or based on the fact that your kids are sharing your room. Now, what happens six months from now or two months from now when, you know, one of your children now says, no, I don't want to, I don't want to share the room with you, mom. I want to, I want my own room. You know, it creates a problem. So we always advise people that so it doesn't matter how many, it doesn't matter how many kids are, uh, are sharing a rooms. Uh, the principle is that each child must have access to their own bedroom. It's very important. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you get uh, sibling groups from a local authority in terms of placements, uh, local authorities will allow and we will allow, you know, sibling groups of the same sex to share a room uh, based on the uh, based on the risk assessment from the local authority uh, and or you know, if there's a girl, they will share with the girl. If they are brother and sister from the same house, they can share a room. Um, but you cannot have a situation where you have a child from, say, Leicester local authority and Birmingham local authority coming in to share the same room, even if they are the same sex. So they will need to have access to their own, own bedrooms. So space is, a, is an issue. You need to make sure that you've got the right amount of spaces. Your children all have bedrooms and then you have a spare bedroom which you can then dedicate uh, to fostering. Um, I also see on the um, questionnaire about uh, a garden. Is that a necessity for fostering? Yeah, I, I mean, like with any, you know, not everybody has access to a garden, but those people who do, uh, most of them do enjoy a garden, and certainly kids who also enjoy a garden. But the, the main reason why we ask about the garden is just to make sure that when we actually uh, do a visit, which we call an, uh, an uh, effect finding visit to your property, we can also have a look at the garden you know, just to see how beautiful it is. You know, most gardens are quite nice, but, you know, there are situations where, you know, the garden may be full of, you know, used washing machines and used beds and, uh, you know, collectible items <laughs> and which may not be safe for, for the child. So we, we also then help you to say, hey, look at this space. It's a nice space, but you may need to get rid of all this stuff. You know, just look at the fence, you know, just to make sure the fence is secure. The child will not sneak out to the neighbors, you know, when you're cooking. You know, you know, if you have a pond, a fish pond or a swimming pool, it's secure. You know, there's no sharp objects around and the place is nice and secure. So that's really the reason why we want to make sure the garden is safe. But if you don't have a garden, it's not a barrier because, uh, you know, you can always find innovative ways of making sure your kids have access to outdoor space. Okay. So like a park or something like that would be exactly. perfect. Exactly. All right. Yeah. So altogether, basically what, when it comes to accommodation, what you're saying is that, um, if I understand this correctly, is that each foster child must have their own room, uh, for like, it's their own personal space that they can go to. Exactly. Um, and if there's a garden, it's it's okay if you don't have a garden, but obviously everyone wants a little garden and it must it just needs to be safe for foster exactly. children. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Because you find that not everybody who has a garden. Um, yes. Or a safe area. Yeah, not everybody who actually has a garden is safe, you know, actually looks after them very well. But you know, it's mm -hmm. always it's always good to, you know, when, and not every child likes playing in the garden you see so 
it's all about just making sure that the spaces that are available, whether it's a garden, whether it's a, you know, it's a, it's a balcony on a flat, for example, it's safe, you know, for the kids to actually um, spend some time there. So that, that's, it's all about safety, really. That's what it's about. Of course, of course. Okay. Um, looking, looking down uh, after the accommodation, there comes to employment. Uh, so, oh, yeah. like, does that mean? I obviously foster caring is a paid a paid job, um, yeah. and does this mean you have to have a job on the side, or does this mean that um, you have to quit your job to become a foster care or anything like this? Yeah, uh, yeah, very interesting question. Uh, the reason why we normally ask whether people are employed. Uh, again, it's not about to make somebody feel bad, especially if they're not employed. Uh, it's about making sure that, you know, if you are employed, for example, uh, you are able to you are able to be flexible or to find flexible uh, to do flexible working, especially if you're a single carer and you get into fostering, you know, we ask you things like, you know, are you flexible at your work and you get time off, you know, can you reduce your hours if you need to, especially when you have a placement, you know, those things are very critical because there are people who get into fostering for all the good reasons. And then they discover that, Oh, I love my job too much. I can't, I can't quit, you know, or I can't reduce my hours and it becomes a problem, you see. Uh, so we try and explore that in detail, you know, if you're a teacher, we want to see, you know, how passionate you are about teaching and are you passionate enough or are you flexible enough to leave the area of passion to then dedicate into fostering because fostering can become, you know, a full-time job. Or in most, for most people, it's, it's actually a full-time job, especially when you have placements. It will need a lot of your time, concentration, effort. You know, you need to be mentally there psychologically there so but it doesn't stop you from working i mean if you are working you can still work but it, in the hours will be significantly reduced uh, because you don't you know you don't want a situation where you can't you know attend meetings statutory meetings planning meetings you can't, you can't do a school run or any an emergency school run if there's an incident at school things like that so employment is about flexibility and also uh, to try and find out, you know, whether you've really thought about how it will affect you financially, you know, if you were going to reduce your hours, you know, do you love fostering enough to be able to, you know, uh, in times when you don't have a placement, are you able to quickly find work or are you able to, are you financially secure enough to be able to, you know, stay resilient when there is an issue with placements, maybe for, for whatever reason you can't, you know, you're not getting a placement quickly enough because these things do happen. So we try and explore all those things for you to make you see what could happen, you know, the, the, the best case scenario and the worst case scenario. So you are fully prepared for any eventuality. If you're a couple, you know, who's really going to be the main carer, you know, and who's going to be the one who's very available and how are you going to support each other in terms of meeting the needs of the child and whilst you're also uh, going about with your daily uh, work business. So, yeah, so it's about work and also support because that's key. You know, support is also very key. That know. was my next question because yeah. foster caring can be quite challenging at times, uh, very rewarding also, um, but you also need a key support network. And if you have, for example, uh, come from Brazil, or something uh, you've just moved to the uk and you've just got your full permanent license and visa to live here and work here uh but you don't really know anybody what would you what was your position on that yeah so part of the assessment process you know part of the reason why it takes so long is because we don't want to just bundle up people and say hey come on you know just sign up become a foster care our role as an agency is actually to support you you know because most people when they come to us they say hey i really want to foster i've got space or i'm new in the area i don't really know anybody so support is very important because you will need it uh you need to have people who can help you as backup carers uh to help you in time and uh, when you have placements and when emergencies arise with the child or you can't or you need to be somewhere and you need somebody to help you with the child and trusted people that is you will need that support so we encourage people to build up 
a very good support network, um, which, you know, so it's not just about having a, a, a huge number of people signed up. It's about, you know, looking at the quality of support that those people can provide, you know, and obviously numbers, quantity numbers are also good. The more people you have, the better it is. Uh, so support is very key. And when we have people coming to us who wants to get to, to foster and they don't and we realize that they don't have support um I, I would normally advise say hey okay let's start working on building a support network you know whilst we are doing the assessments let's work on that and we'll be checking on that to see if there is now enough support if there isn't enough support sometimes we may advise you to you know consider really building uh, some some kind of support network because it's so it's so critical for you. But you know, but Banya will be your first support. <laughs> Obviously, we will help you through that journey to help you actually connect with people. We've got we we have got uh, we can invite you to fostering uh, training uh, sessions that where you can actually meet real time Banya foster carers. And those are places where you can actually meet up with other carers or actually doing uh, stuff in your area and build relationships, you know, uh, how we can help you to network. But most of that is up to you to really build your own network, uh, people that you can trust to help you on your journey for to fostering. Mm. Of course. And I'm guessing that most of the people in your support network that you might have, will you will meet on these training courses Absolutely, you know, and we do events. You see, so um, it's not it's not unusual. Sometimes if we notice that somebody is, does not have enough support, sometimes we can make a judgment call. And say, hey, let me invite um, let me invite these applicants or this family to this particular event or um, uh, uh, some of the banya, you know. Um, uh, events we do so maybe we're going to be doing bowling for example for the children so we can we can invite you in some cases just so you can meet other people you can start forming a relationship and well i found that it's so helpful for somebody to actually meet somebody say hey what's your name oh i'm a, I'm a carer where do you live and you know people get connect like that and you know that support especially from other carers is, is very important as well because you you know you can benefit a lot from that but really it does not replace you connecting with your own people, your own network, because you will need people to support you either physically or actually, you know, just finding somebody to talk to about some of the things that you are, you're going through. And um, with regards to, may I ask, the training, um, are there any specific things you want to tell us about the training? Yeah, uh, actually, part of uh, what we do when we, um, when we, when we're talking about this first inquiry is we, always tell you that, you know, Banya, we, we offer training uh, and we actually offer training once every month, especially when you become a foster carer. And we talk about that because training is so important when, especially when you are new and even when you are, you know, coming from another agency, we don't assume that, you know, you, you've got all the training. So we encourage all our applicants actually to bear in mind that they're going to be requested to attend training. They're going to be, it's going to be a requirement for them to attend training. It's just once a month. So it's not taxing. It's just once a month. And the trainings are very good, very informative, and they give you very good understanding and uh, of the role and give you practical skills on how to deal with specific situations and how to understand, give you understanding on various various topics you know uh so training is so important and we value um training and we encourage carers to uh, applicants to attend but we also give you an initial training that we call skills to foster uh and in the past we used to do it quite later on in the assessment but we of late we have brought it quite near because we uh quite closer to in earlier on in the assessment because it allows you to to really understand the whole picture quite early on uh, there are things that we can't you can't talk to you on the phone to tell you about what goes on in fostering we can answer questions but not everything so skills to foster training is very important it happens over three days we look after you you know it, it happens in the area in your area if you are living far we make sure that you are able to come there um, but most people who attend the training they find it helpful because it gives them that understanding they need to get into fostering and to make the decisions that are key about whether they really want to continue or not. So um, 
if you come after the training and you say, hey, you know what, uh, I really found that quite helpful. You know, you really, you really unwrap, you know, unpack the whole world of fostering. It's a good result. But if you come to us and say, hey, woo, that was deep. That was too heavy for me. I don't think I'm ready. Again, that's a good result because we have empowered you. Uh, I think we were just about to talk, talk. I was just about to ask you about um, the next part of the questionnaire, which is the experience. Yes. Uh, yeah, the experience, uh, again, you know, like the other questions that we were talking about, it's just for us to understand where you are uh, as, a, as an individual. We don't assume that everybody has any experience, uh, either as a foster carer, uh, though we have some foster carers who actually want to move from their agencies or from the local authority to Banya, so that comes in as a as a plus because that person actually has a, quite a lot of experience. But you know, so we want to just find out about you know where you are in terms of experience. Do you have any experience looking after children or caring for children? You know, most people say, ah, I've got my own kids, that's enough experience, <laughs> you know, but you know, for those people who do not have their own children, you know, do you have any experience caring for children, either for, you know, your relatives, you know, maybe you look after children, maybe you're a child minder, or, or you've, you've, you've had first-hand experience just looking after children, uh, especially for those people who do not have their own birth children. So that's a, that's a key question. But, you know, zero or 100 plus experience does not, you know, stop you from fostering. It just helps us to understand where you are so we can give you the right kind of support that you need. Uh, and also to really help you to understand yourself, where you are in terms of your capacity and your abilities as well. Yeah, so for example, if you've been a foster carer before or if you've ever applied to be a foster carer before with any agency, we can find out about that and talk about, you know, what happened, you know, if it didn't go through, you can, we can talk about that to find out, you know, maybe why you know, the assessment did not go through or if you were a foster carer before and maybe you stopped, you know, we can also, you know, find out about that as well, uh, both from you and we can also also have a chat with the local authority as well to see, uh, to make sure that everything is okay. Um, people leave uh, agencies and local authorities or some people leave fostering for different reasons, you see. So, uh, so we wanna explore that as well to find out whether, you know, come, you coming back to fostering is the right kind of choice for you now and we support you through that. So certainly having some experience with children also helps it's always a plus but if you don't know if you do not have uh, any experience working with children then again banya will be your support with that we make sure that you've got the right kind of you know training that you will need so that you are ready to look after children um so we can also ask about you know if you've been registered as a uh, child minder you know some people may have been uh, carers at you know nurseries or you know been supporting children at school any kind of support and, and any kind of experience that you've had is always very good uh, and it's also uh, important for us to check with the places where you've worked you know with children just to make sure that you know your record also speaks well of you uh, yeah, so that that's key, really. That's uh, basically the the reasons why we explore that part of experience to make sure that you are able and you are actually uh, in a position to look after children. Okay, um, well, thank you for that. Um, so, what after you've done your initial acquire, which is usually done over the telephone, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, once you've done that, um, what what happens after that? Does is there any type of commitment to fully becoming a carer after that? Yeah. Actually, you know, part of the part of the discussion that we have during your first inquiry is we also explain. You know, so I'll explain to you the stages, the key stages that are there. Uh, just to give you an understanding of how long it takes, how long it can take, you know, and the kind of things that you can, you need to be ready for. 
Um, the reason being that, you know, if we don't say it out on that call quite early on, uh, some people may be overwhelmed or underwhelmed. <laughs> Most people will be like surprised, like, oh, how come you didn't tell us about this? Oh, how come you didn't tell us that somebody may be coming to my house? You know, so we like to, to be quite open with you from the start to say, okay, this is what happens when you, uh, when we feel like you've got space, you've got time, this is what's going to happen. So we'll take you through, we'll explain the stages to you so that you can then commit, you know, in that call, in the conversation to uh, us actually then taking you through those stages. So, for example, we've got the initial inquiry, which is what we'll be doing with you talking, going through all these questions. That, that's the inquiry stage. And once that inquiry stage is done and we are happy that you've got space and you've got time, then we actually then approve you to go to the first stage. The first stage of the inquiry has got two stages, A and B. The A part of the stage is where we actually do a fact-finding visit. We come and see the house, you know, physically, uh, check the rooms that are available for fostering, just make sure the house uh, is not being renovated, half of the house is not open to the weather, you know, making sure that you are, you don't have any plans to move, you know, uh, in the near future, because it's all important stuff, check your garden, like you were saying before, you know, just making sure that the house is nice, uh, you know, if, if the house has got too much collectibles inside, you know, we can also talk about that to encourage you to maybe think about, you know, you know, moving them to another kind of space so that the child can have a nice space. Uh, and if your house is very immaculate, which is nice, you know, we also prepare you to say, hey, you know, your house may be nice now, but are you prepared for vento and black currant juice on your carpet? You know, we talk about it, you know what I mean? Things like that. <laughs> practical things that, that yeah. people don't think about, you know. And, you know, we always find it helpful. Face-to-face -face interaction, exploring things, you get to ask questions, all that happens on the first inquiry, or on the first visit. And when you're happy, you know, and when we have explained everything, then we take you through the paperwork, you know, we help you fill in all the, all the boring stuff, all the paperwork, we help you to do that. And when you're filling in stuff, you're not signing anything, you're not getting into any contract or anything. It's just the information that we need to collect from you so that we can do the necessary checks. So for example, on that stage A, we then do the, your local authority check. We do your police check. We also uh, check with your references as well. And we also ask you to do your medical, which uh, we leave all the forms with you. You can just phone your GP and book a full medical, which Banya pays for. How good is that? You don't have to pay for the DPS. We pay for it because we value you so much. So, um, so all we need from you is just to be open, to be transparent, you know, even as we are also open and transparent with you because we value you as a person. And we know that these kids are not coming into a warehouse. They are coming into an actual home. So we need to make sure that you are ready. Um, so that's the first step. So during that time, uh, we expect that everything should be back, you know, I would give you like four weeks to make sure that references respond, uh, local authorities back to gets back to us, your police check is done, you know, your medical has been done. You know, I would give you like a month to have everything together. Once everything is there, the report is done, our agency decision maker is able to make a decision to say, hey, based on the reports that we received, everything checks out. We are happy to proceed ahead. We check with you again. Do you feel like you're happy to proceed? You say, yes, then we proceed. And during that time, that's when we do the skills to foster. You know, we'd like to make sure that you're happy as well. Um, and then once the agency decision maker makes a decision to take you to the, net, to the part B uh, of, of the assessment, which is stage two, uh, then we're able now to uh, appoint an assessing social worker uh, which uh, who will come into your house to do to meet up with you and to finish uh, the greater part of the assessment. So in stage one, we've got the, the stage one A, which is the initial visit where we come and see your house. Once that is done, we go to stage B of part A, which is now doing the checks and doing the final report, leading to an agency decision maker making a decision, which then leads us to stage two, where you will now be able to be assessed by a professional, uh, by an appointed uh, assessing social worker who will now 
draw up final report which will be presented at our Banya panel. Our Banya panel is made up of independent panel members and also some Banya staff and they'll be able to look at your report which our social worker would have presented and make a decision to say okay we are recommending that you be approved or we are not recommending but you know what when part of the reason why we actually take you through these stages stage by stage is so that by the time we appoint an assessing social worker we are sure that yes we've got a winning team we've got a winning uh, client here so we don't like taking people to panel whom we feel like they're not ready you know we don't want to have eggs on our faces there so we try and work together with you so that both you and us we're working together to create a winning report and that's the reason why we have an assessing social worker coming through they will come to do a series of meetings with you come up with a, uh, with a nice comprehensive report which gives the panel a full-blown comprehensive picture of where you're coming from where you've been, what you've been through, you know, the challenges you've seen in your life, all those things are explored. And we're able to then say, hey, you know, this is the person that we have. This is their, these are their strengths. These are their areas that need further development, but we want to make sure that it's a winning report. So that's what, that's what we uh, call the last stage in stage two. I hope, <laughs> I, hope <I'm> not, <laughs> I haven't made it too complicated, but it's quite clear. Um, so, so those are the key stages. So that whole process, that whole process from the time that we see you at your house to the time that we take you to panel, you know, we give a guidance of eight months. That's the general guidance. But you know, as an agency, we wouldn't want to drag the whole process for eight months. We want to make sure we do it expediently, but without cutting any corners. We want to follow the law. So that's where we do. So we try and make it shorter, but the general guidance is eight months. Excellent. So, okay, so I think that was very clear and very thorough. Thank you, Heavens, and thank you, Tom, for being here today.